Uh, we work at the State University of New York downstate, which is in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, we're all under lockdown, as I'm sure many of you are as well. Uh, Salvador and I have been working on variants of this project uh, for over 10 years now, starting with a DARPA grant some time ago. Uh, I'm a I'm the older colleague, as you may be able to perceive. Uh, Salvador is a uh, younger, but uh, we really have, have worked together quite closely. Title of our project is uh, to decipher the brain's neural code through large-scale detailed simulation of cortical circuits. Um, so I'll take the next slide, Salvador. And um, this work uh, we've been doing for many years, but has uh, recently been given a new initiative by the Obama Brain Initiative. It stands for Brain Research Through Advancing Innovative Neurotechnologies. Uh, as noted in the quote there, we uh, haven't begun really to unlock the mysteries of the brain. And, and uh, I'll say a little more about that uh, in a minute, just as part of this introduction. Uh, that knowledge will certainly be transformative, both in terms of clinical approach. And I myself actually am a neurologist. We also work very closely with psychiatrists. Uh, we deal with a lot of diseases, including epilepsy, Alzheimer's disease, schizophrenia, uh, and really trying to understand these diseases from a fundamental viewpoint, as well as to understand how the brain works, how it codes information. Um, these innovative neurotechnologies are now allowing people, including our collaborators, to record from hundreds, and soon we hope thousands to tens of thousands of neurons, which are the primary cell type of the brain. Now, along with glia are, are one of the primary cell types of the brain. Uh, at the same time, and so get enormous amounts of information, terabytes, probably soon to be petabytes, uh, that we can start to incorporate into our models. And uh, this uh, work that we do and that we've been doing through ECAS with uh, Internet2 is really part of one of these in innovative neurotechnologies. And in fact, we wrote a white paper that got picked up by NIH on this saying that innovative neurotechnology is not simply and only the technology that is needed to record from the brain or to stimulate the brain, but also the technology that's needed to understand the brain. And that's what we're doing here with software. Uh, next slide, please. So we have a variety of projects. Uh, one thing that maybe makes us a little different from some of the other groups we've heard from is that we are really very closely involved uh, really in all of the projects we've listed here, uh, but also even in some that we haven't. So we work extremely closely with our collaborators, often writing code for and with them, uh, rather than uh, simply providing uh, a platform. So we've, we've been doing a lot of this work ourselves, Salvador's been doing a lot of this work himself. Uh, we need to say the brain for the aforementioned reasons. The clinical is absolutely vital, uh, of course. Alzheimer's disease, schizophrenia being just two that I need uh, only mention briefly because people know what they are. Um, we are very focused on biological models, and I want to really emphasize this. The work that's being done in artificial neural networks in deep learning, which gets a lot of publicity, and rightly so, is very important and offers us a lot of insights that we then bring to our modeling, as well as tools that we bring to our model. However, that type of model, the deep learning model, is not a good model of the brain and certainly is not useful for a clinical understanding of the brain. So we uh, feel very strongly that there's an enormous need to really get into the brain tissue and see how things work. And just to give one example, of course, the things that are remarkable about what deep learning has been able to do are things like playing chess and uh, playing Go, but to do things that a robot needs to do or that an organism needs to do, to do what a housefly can do in terms of navigation, in terms of evasion, in terms of understanding the environment in an instant by instant basis is the kind of thing that nervous systems are remarkably well adapted for um, and uh, that, that really is a separate sort of behavioral domain than what uh, deep learning is looking at. So we think that the brain is a, a really different kind of machine, if you will. 
Uh, we've looked at particular models of motor cortex because we are interested in behavior, and Salvador will show some examples later of how important that is for what's called brain-machine interface, the idea that you can control a machine with your brain, uh, very important for people who are paralyzed, of course, um, and to understand both how to read the motor cortex, how to read what the mind is thinking it wants to do, and also how to write, because there's a sensory motor loop. The sensations and the motor are really intimately connected. And if you don't know what feedback you're getting from the environment, you don't make the right movements. So this is really important to do both reading and writing as we begin to better understand the brain. Uh, the sensory work that we've been doing has been mostly focused, uh, number four here, on auditory cortex models which has uh, been started now in collaboration with uh, Sammy Moten and Peter Lakatos at NKI, but uh, really has become part of this project as well. Uh, and we've been able to really make some uh, remarkable progress there where one can look at uh, oscillations, which is a big topic in brain recording and in brain understanding that's not so much represented in deep learning. You can look at the oscillations, understand the oscillations, understand how they relate to the oscillations that come into our ears, uh, the sound that comes in to the system. Um, and a big part of what we're doing, which has uh, been uh, Salvador's uh, work in the past uh, three or four years, is building a particular tool uh, that we've called NetPine that not only enables us to do these very large simulations, as you'll see, but that has been used now by a number of other groups. So we are also building this platform that's uh, really used widely. So uh, I, I'm not gonna summarize here. I'm gonna just pass this on now to Salvador to talk in, in quite a bit of detail. And uh, just to mention, Salvador has really taken the lead in this ECAS project, as well as in a couple of these other projects and, and has done a fantastic job. We'll show, show you what he's done and what we've done. Salvador. Thank you, Bill. Um, so I'm going to start uh, with this section, why study the brain? And I think there's many reasons, as Bill was just saying, but one of the main ones is uh, this idea that approximately one out of four people suffer some kind of brain disorder. So you can say Parkinson's, schizophrenia, autism, Alzheimer's. So I think we all know someone who has been affected by one of these. And so uh, studying the brain allows you to understand these disorders better and to potentially develop treatments. And as an example, I want to show uh, this video of this paralyzed woman who has been implanted with some electrodes in the motor cortex of her brain. And so the idea is that the signals from her brain are going to be recorded and then converted into signals to move the robotic arm where she wants to move. I can move it up and straight down and left and right and diagonally. I can close it and open it and I can go forward and back. That is just the most astounding thing I've ever seen. Can we shake hands? Sure. No, really? Yeah. Like, come right over here? Yes, you come over okay. there. Okay. Grasp your hand there. There we go. Oh my goodness. Wow. And I can do a fist bump if you'd like. <laughs> That's amazing. <clears throat> so this is pretty amazing. And the surprising thing is that there were only about 100 neurons being recorded from a brain with 86 uh, billion. And you can still see a pretty decent movement. Uh, so it's it's incredible to imagine what we can do when we actually understand better all of the brain function and we can record from, from more of these neurons and even stimulate back into the brain. The problem is that the brain is pretty complex and in particular it has many nested levels. So if we look at the outside part of the brain, uh, what we call the cortex, uh, this is usually, if you extend it, it would be more or less the size of a pizza with about one or two millimeters uh, depth. And it's segmented into different sections. So one of them would be responsible for vision, the visual cortex, which is in the back, another one for motor, uh, motor movements, uh, one for audition. However, if you zoom into one of these sections, into one of these cortical areas, you will see a very complicated circuitry. So we'll see 
thousands and even millions of neurons that are organized into different layers, usually six different layers, each doing a different function, connecting to each other and sending signals. Uh, so neurons communicate with these spikes, which are like small peaks of electricity that are sent to each other via synapses. However, if you zoom even more into one of these neurons by itself, it's already a really complicated structure. So it's a very complicated machinery with lots of different ionic channels, which enable the generation of different electric currents. You have lots of different synapses. And the, the most complicated thing is that all these different parts at different scales interact with each other. So for example, you test a drug or you look at the molecular reactions happening at the smallest level inside the neuron, they will affect how the neuron fires in turn affecting how the circuit is responding, generating, for example, uh, oscillations or connections between different layers. And that will in turn affect uh, the, the behavior of the whole brain and actually the human behavior. But it also goes the other way around. So oscillations at the whole brain level might affect single neurons and the molecular reactions. So how do we make sense of all this complexity? So we are lucky that in the, in the past years, in recent years, we've had, we have had a, a massive amount of experimental data coming in. And so for example, here I'm showing these six layers that I was talking about. Uh, in, in most of the cortical areas have this similar structure. And you see that there are different cell, cell types in different layers. So in layer four, you see these cells that project up to layer one. The same for uh, layer five, layer six. And you see that there are different types. So they do different things. They project to different parts of the brain. So for example, these PT cells, which we're gonna focus on, they're called pyramidal tract, and they project to spinal cord. So they're basically the output of this system, of these cortical areas. So we have a lot of experimental data, both on the um, morphology, the shape of the cells, the, the function that they do, how they're connected, and one way to put all this information together is through computational simulations. So we can gather information from many different experiments and build a single simulation that contains all of this information. So you see here is one of these large scale simulations uh, simulating a column in one of these cortices with thousands of neurons connected to each other based on experimental data. So in the next section, I want to emphasize some, something that Bill already mentioned, is the complexity of these single neurons and how they differ from artificial neurons, which are most commonly known. And so here I'm showing again, this is just the large number of different types of neurons that you can find in cortex. On the left-hand side, you can see the excitatory cell types. And on the right-hand side, all of the inhibitory cell types, they all have very specific morphologies, very specific functions that do uh, some have some specific role in the circuit. So the first step for us is to build models of these individual cell types. And here you see an example of one of the models of these PT cells from motor cortex. So you see in the left, the actual morphology from biology reconstructed uh, from experiments. And you see how we reproduce that in the simulation. So you see it's practically identical. It has 700 small different compartments to reproduce all the exact shape of the cell. We also reproduce the, the actual physiology, so the response of the neuron to different inputs. So the neurons themselves have approximately thousands or even 10,000 inputs from other neurons in the circuit. And what they do is they integrate all this information and then they generate an output signal, usually composed of these spikes to communicate. So what we have to do is uh, make sure that this output signal is uh, reproducing what we see in, in biology. And to do that, we have to play around with some of the parameters of this neuron. So these neurons have lots of different ionic channels. Here we see a bunch of them, sodium, potassium, calcium. And we have to play with the, um, the distributions of these channels and, and sort of the, the level of conductance of these channels, how much they open and close. And through, this, uh, through these parameters, we can adjust to obtain the actual biological response of the neuron. And just so you get an idea of the complexity, 
solving the equations to calculate the voltages and currents of each of these 700 compartments requires essentially solving hundreds of differential equations at every time step. And we run simulations with a time step of 0 0.025 milliseconds, which means solving hundreds of differential equations 40,000 times a second for a single neuron. So just to illustrate a bit more the complexity of these neurons, there was a recent paper showing how they compare to uh, neural networks, to the famous deep learning. And so to reproduce the function of a single neuron, uh, they required a seven layer deep neural network. So the computation power of one neuron is equivalent to this pretty complex deep learning network. And um, so one of the features of single, ne uh, single neural models is of single neurons is that they actually do some kind of frequency filtering. So different parts of the neuron, different parts of the dendrite where the inputs are received, they can enhance or filter out uh, inputs depending on their frequency. And this allows the neuron to integrate inputs from different parts of the brain uh, depending on the frequency that they arrive at. So one of our students, a PhD student, has been looking at this function in this uh, number of cells in the in, in cortex. And he has run, this was one of the first uh, simulations that we're running in Google Cloud, thousands of simulations to explore the effects of these different ionic channels, which are basically related to different drugs that you can provide to the brain and how they affect frequency filtering. Um, so this is very relevant to diseases such, such as epilepsy or schizophrenia, which are very based on oscillations in the brain. And so knowing the effect of these different drugs on, on the ionic channels gives you an idea of how they can affect the whole circuit behavior and how we can better understand these disorders and develop potential treatments. So uh, we're working on a paper, which is already finished. We hope to submit next month uh, with the results from these uh, simulations for the single neuron run on Google Cloud. So the next step that I'm gonna talk about is the model of motor cortex circuits. So now we're combining many of these single neurons into a larger network model. And this will give you an idea of why we need com cloud computing to run these simulations. So our model of motor cortex consists of simulating a volume of tissue in the brain of the mouse, which is approximately the shape of a column, and it's 0.1 millimeters cubed, so smaller than a grain of salt. However, this tissue already contains approximately 10,000 neurons, and we are simulating each of the neurons in this volume of tissue with the exact densities that you would find in the real brain, the exact connectivities, Etc., including the 30 million, approximately 30 million synaptic connections that you would find within this cortical column and which are uh, implemented in a very uh, biologically determined way. So, we look at a lot of experimental data to see how all these different cell types connect to each other and we implement that in the model. So, here's a summary of the different cell populations that you can find in our network. On the left hand side, you see the dimensions of the volume that we are simulating. And for example, you can see the different boundaries of the different layers in cortex, all based on experimental data. You can see different excitatory cell types, which are present in all layers, these IT cells. You can see the PT cells that we mentioned before, which are only in layer 5B. And we also have uh, two different types of inhibitory cell types, which, which play a major role also in, in cortical circuits. In terms of the connectivity, we made a major effort to integrate information from over 20 different papers, so combining information uh, on the inputs from different parts of the brain. So the motor cortex receives inputs from somatosensory cortex, from thalamus, thalamus, which is where the inputs from the outside come, from the secondary motor cortex, which, which is another part of the brain dedicated to movement. And so we map very accurately how all of these inputs project to our circuit model. We also uh, included information of how the, lo the local circuit connects. So all this, the neurons that we have, the 10,000 neurons that we have in our circuit model, how do they connect to each other? And this happens based on both the cell type, 
and the layer that they belong to. So this is a very specific pattern of connectivity that we include in the model. And we even include information about how the different synapses are distributed in single cells. So you, I told you before that there are like a, approximately 10,000 synapses providing inputs from 10,000 different neurons into a single cell, and they connect to specific parts of the neuron. Some go to the top part of the neuron and have a specific function, or it goes to the region near the soma, which is the, the base of the neuron, and they provide a, a different kind of function. So after integrating all this information, we, uh, I wanna just illustrate what the amount of computing power that is required to simulate this column with 10,000 neurons and 30 million synapses. So one single second of simulation now requires in the current version of the model, 100 cores during three hours, just for one second of simulation. However, of course, we don't want to run just one second, but we need to run thousands of these, these simulations. And the reason for this are several. So the first one is that initially we have to find the model parameters that reproduce the real brain behavior. So we have a, a model that we construct as much as possible based on experimental data, but then we have to tweak and tune some of the parameters always within biological valid ranges to actually reproduce uh, the activity that we see in experiments. Once this is done and we have a, a model that is reproducing the real brain behavior, we can experiment with the simulated brain. So here we can try different conditions, we can try different treatments, for example, we can stimulate different parts of the circuit, we can provide different drugs, all in this virtual brain that we have constructed. And the third reason why we need to run many simulations is to test like we do on real experiments, we have to run multiple trials or with multiple different subjects. So we have these small variations on the model that we build and we run the same experiment, uh, for example, 25 or 50 times, just to get some uh, statistical validity in the same way that real experiments are run. So I wanna show a specific example of uh, this first point here, finding the model parameters and one new approach that we tried thanks to having uh, Google Cloud. And this is, uh, the reason we wanted to do this is because there were two new, two neuron types that we hadn't included in the model initially, but as new data became, became available, um, it made sense to include them because they were showing that these were quite relevant. Um, so we basically added these two cell types to the model. And of course, now we needed to retune the whole model to make it work again to make it provide the activity that we see in the real brain. And so we tried this approach called uh, evolutionary algorithm optimization. So we had used this approach before for single cells, where you, you run different parameter combinations and you leave the supercomputer for a month and at the end you get the right uh, model parameters. But we had never tried it before on these very large scale network models. And I believe we are the first ones to try on these very biologically detailed network models. So uh, these algorithms con consist, or they are based on, on biology in terms of the evolution that you see in biology. And so you start with an initial population of different potential solutions in the parameter space. And you calculate how good these solutions are. So you select the best of those solutions. And then you apply these to biologic inspired operations. So you mix up the different solutions, you reproduce them, and you add some mutation. So this generates a number of new solutions, which you again compare to see which ones are the best ones, which ones have the better fitness, and you select those, and you run this across many generations. And at the end, the idea is that you get one solution that actually solves the, the problem. So this is what we did with these uh, massive network model. So we run for approximately 68 generations. And we're very happy to see after some debugging that the fitness function was improving over time. So this is the fitness error. So it's good that it's getting down. And so this is an example of uh, the activity of the network in one of the initial solutions, which is pretty bad because most of the neurons are not firing. And at the end, we got a solution which was pretty good, where all the populations were firing within the biological ranges that we wanted to see. 
This, of course, required 68 generations, each one approximately having 50 candidates, so 50 uh, simulations, which made in total 3,400 candidates or simulations. And again, each one requiring three hours on 100 cores. So this gives you an impression of the amount of resources needed just to run this evolutionary optimization, which worked very nicely and probably was more efficient than if we tried to do it by hand. So again, uh, as I was saying, we required thousands of these simulations. So to run a thousand one second simulations requires 100,000 cores during three hours. And this is the reason why uh, the ECAS project was fantastic for us because it has allowed us to do all these kind of very large simulations that we were not able to do before. In particular, when we started running this and building these big models, we started using a, a cluster that we had in the university, which had about 500 cores, although uh, only about 250 worked because we burned a few of them due to the lack of cooling, but we don't want to hear about that. And, but in any case, this became obsolete very quickly as soon as we started ramping up and scaling up the models. We then moved on to the NSF Exceed um, supercomputers. So for example, we've used a lot of Comet. And this was great as it provided up to 7,000 cores at the same time. Uh, however, we, we always had to wait on these queues because of course everybody's using these supercomputers. And so it was sometimes a bit um, frustrating to submit a simulation and then wait for two, three days to actually get the results back. Plus we had these limits on the amount of time that we could run their job. So a limit of usually of 48 hours. And so in the recent years, we moved on to Google Cloud. Um, Google Cloud was fantastic because we, you don't have to wait in any queues. There are, all the cores are for you, available anytime. And we can run virtually on a limited number of cores. The only limitation, of course, is that you have to pay for them. And so again, the, the ECAS grant uh, was fantastic in this sense. And previous to the ECAS project, we, we had been able to run on 30,000 cores simultaneously. And that was a, a big achievement for us. And during ECAS, we, we set the objective of trying to run on 100,000 cores. And this was quite challenging because uh, we had to to ensure that the controller node was able to manage all this amount of jobs and cores, as well as finding a region that actually had the availability for all this number of cores. And just in the last uh, week, we were able to reach this milestone. And so we've been able to run on 100,000 cores. And we had set a limit of 100,000, but we could have actually been uh, gone above that level. So this was quite exciting for us. And because we are running on preemptible cores, it wasn't actually such a, a consumption of credits as we expected. So, and it was actually quite useful. We got lots of results in just one hour. And so this was a very great achievement for us. Uh, of course, Google Platform has facilitated this, um, running these massive simulations using, for example, the Slurm workload manager, which is very useful because we already had our software set up to, to use this job scheduling method. And this is integrated very nicely with Google Cloud. And of course, the use of preemptible nodes, which are about four or five times cheaper. And of, of course, they can remove them at any time, but that usually only happens between 10 and 50% of the time. So they're still quite uh, cost efficient. So we have submitted a paper uh, describing all our approaches and results on running these large scale simulations on Google Cloud and explaining all the issues that we had and the solutions we found and how some of the results that we got. So we've submitted this to the PERC 20 conference and we co-authored with some of the Google uh, technicians that were helping us, engineers, and we hope to hear back in a month or so. So in the next section, I'm gonna show some of the results that we were able to get thanks to this cloud computing. So this is showing the activity of the 10,000 neurons for a period of two seconds. And we see here that uh, the different cell types, the different populations, in different layers, 
produce very different patterns of activity, which is what you see in biology. It depends on the cell type and also the layer. And with, even within the layer, there are different patterns. We've compared this to biological data. So we've teamed up with a couple of labs who do experiments in mice. And for the first time, we've compared each of the populations and cell types to experimental data in a statistical way. Uh, so the bars, the gray bars here show um, results from real mice and that particular cell type. And it compares very nicely with our model. So we're quite happy about this. We also saw in the, in the model uh, many oscillations, which is a very common feature of brains. Uh, so oscillations in the gamma frequency, about 40 hertz, also in, in the delta frequency, around 5 hertz. And interestingly, these, uh, these oscillations emerge spontaneously, as we say. So we didn't really enforce the oscillations to come from the model. We didn't drive the model with oscillatory inputs, but they emerge from the connectivity and the properties of the cell types. We also saw this phenomena called phase amplitude coupling, where one of the oscillations is modulating the other one, similar to the radio AM or FM. And of course, these oscillations and this coupling has a major role in neural coding and also in behavior, as well as in many disorders. So here on the, I didn't mention, but on the left, we can see the experimental data, and on the right, the actual simulation, which looks comparably very similar. We also looked at the spectrogram of these uh, oscillations. So we see here from experiment, uh, the oscillations are around the range of 20 to 40 hertz, and they, they change over time, which is also what we're seeing in the simulation. Of course, what the simulation, the advantage of the simulation is that it provides access to the full system, and we can investigate and tweak and look at all the values in the model. So this gave us a lot of insights onto how, into how these uh, oscillations are generated. So what are the mechanisms at the level of the cell, at the level of the circuit? So we, for example, saw that different populations in the network were oscillating at different phases. So some were oscillating with the major oscillation we saw, and other ones were in antiphase, which was quite interesting for us. One of the things we looked into is this idea of information flow or the flow of activity. So uh, some of the inputs to the, to the network come into one of the layers usually from either from the outside, from thalamus or from other parts of the brain. And this activity, this information propagates to different layers with a specific pattern. So we were able to quantify this uh, very accurately in our model. So for example, inputs arriving from the thalamus, they typically went to the upper layers first, which is what you see in biology, and then they propagate down to these corticospinal cells, which provide output to the spinal cord. So the sensory inputs activate some neurons, which process information to figure out what's going on in the outside world, and then they send out a signal to the motor cortex to move the body. And we saw a different pattern of activation when we uh, provided inputs from other parts of the brain. We also looked at sort of the pairwise flow of information between all of the populations in, in our model. So this provided like a, a new measure of this information flow across the full set of populations. And it provided some insights that we weren't expecting. So it predicted a major role for some inhibitory connections. And this wasn't actually apparent from the initial sort of anatomical connectivity that we put into the model. And so this is interesting, the, the important role that's, that inhibition had in the, in the network. And we also found uh, some of this propagation of information depended on the layer, that, on the target layer. And so different frequencies were used for different layers which is an idea used in uh, neural coding on how to encode information in the brain uh, that's called multiplexing. And so we are also interested in looking more into that. Finally, uh, we're very excited about this new set of results. Uh, we started a collaboration with several labs who were doing in vivo experiments in mice. And so we started looking also at the relation of our model and, uh, and the different parameters in our model to behavior. In particular, uh, this experiment looks at 
how this uh, neurotransmitter called noradrenaline affects the behavior of mice. And you see that when noradrenaline is present, the mice makes this kind of precise movements, whereas without noradrenaline, the movements are misplaced, they're not accurate. So this is of course related to movement disorder, and we're trying to understand a bit more why this is happening. Uh, so one of the theories was that uh, this noradrenaline is modifying the response or how one of the cell types fires, in particular this layer 5B neurons, so we could see from the experiments that they fire more when you have noradrenaline and less when you don't. So in the model, we were able to reproduce this because the models are so biologically detailed. We have access to all these different channels. And we could see how noradrenaline was affecting one of these ionic channels called the HCN channels. And that is what caused the PT cells, this uh, type of cells in the F5B, to increase their firing. And that is what, in theory, led to the precise movement. So we could reproduce the experiment in our single cell simulations. Uh, so the effect of noradrenaline in the cells. And we could also reproduce it on the network level. So we saw that with noradrenaline, we were getting this much higher activation of this population. And so we were able to use the model to validate this uh, hypothesis of the effect of noradrenaline and how it relates to behavior. We also then compared to much uh, to other data that this paper, experimental paper had. So they were looking at these different levels of noradrenaline together with different levels of uh, thalamic input, this input from the outside. And a combination of these two things is what led to the high activity in these cells and in theory to behavior. So we were able to reproduce this pattern very nicely with the simulation. So we have the same two types of uh, variables and how they affect the output of these layer 5 cells. But again, the, the model allowed us to go even further and pick apart these layer 5 cells and into different cell types. And so we saw that the effect of these two variables, the noradrenaline and the thalamic input, affected very differently different cell types within this layer 5. Uh, this was beyond what people could do in, their, in the experiments because they could not pick apart of all these different cell types. And even within a specific cell type, different parts, depending on the part of the layer they were in, they, were, they uh, responded very differently. So this is a, a major prediction that our, our model is making, and that in hopefully eventually can be tested experimentally. And of course, has implications to understanding and treating motor disorders. So we've, uh, we submitted a paper a while ago, and the the senior reviewers wanted to add more comparison to this in vivo experimental data. So this is what we have been doing with thanks to the ICAS project. And we are now ready to resubmit the paper and hopefully now goes in. Finally, an, uh, another set of results who, uh, from another from a postdoc from the lab. He has been looking at this idea of avalanches, neuron, neuronal avalanches which is a phenomenon which is widespread in cortex, but is not really properly understood. And they, uh, they are basically cascades of spiking that start from a single stimulation point. And so there are different chains, sort of a chain of reaction where one cell spikes and then generates other cells to spike. And the interesting feature is that the, the distribution of these avalanches is very specific. And so you find many short avalanches, many short duration avalanches, and just a few very long duration avalanches. So we wanted to try to reproduce this phenomena in our model. And for that, we required running very long simulations. So we needed to run a simulation that was 600 seconds, so 10 minute simulation. And remember before we were running just one second simulation, so this was like 600 times longer. Uh, for example, we wouldn't have done that on the Exceed supercomputers because they have a limit of two days. So we were able to do it on Google Cloud. This took about one week to run. And so now we had data on how these avalanches propagate in the model during 600 biological seconds. We then thought that it might be possible to uh, run these kind of simulations because we wanted to repeat the, the same experiment with, uh, with other parameters.
to run them in a shorter time if we increase the number of cores we are using for the simulator. However, we run into some issues uh, because increasing the number of cores required using multiple nodes. And of course, these nodes can be in different parts of the world. So we are seeing that we're getting very, in, very high internode latencies. And this was... Oh. Postman. This was resulting in uh, very long delays uh, that were crashing the simulation. So we were not able to run on multiple nodes. And so we, uh, we talked to the Google guys and they suggested using these placement groups, uh, where, which are nodes which are located in the same location and they're designed to have very low latencies and high bandwidth. So we have now been placed on this alpha project of Google Cloud, uh, studying placement groups. So I think we're one of the first groups to try it out. And we are setting it up and we hope to be able to run these long avalanches, uh, long duration avalanches, uh, much faster using these placement groups. In any case, we did obtain some results and they were very, very positive. So you see here this distribution I was talking about. So on the y-axis, you see the number of avalanches, and on the x-axis, the duration of the avalanches. So you see that you get many of the short avalanches, but just a few of the very long ones. You see here are results with the 600 simulation, 600 second simulation. And so this matches very nicely what you see in experimental data as well. As far as we know, this is the first detailed cortical simulation to reproduce this phenomenon as well. And again, the model provided further insight. So we're seeing that this these avalanches um, were ongoing by itself. So we just provide like a short simulation at the beginning, and then they trigger this activity that goes for potentially many minutes. And we see very, uh, very recurring patterns. So we see patterns that are repeated themselves all over and over again uh, with different frequencies in the delta, beta, and gamma range. And so all this uh, we think is useful for to understanding different neural coding strategies that the brain might have. And so we're analyzing this in more detail. We are also uh, preparing a, a paper on this topic of avalanches. I, it's almost ready as well, and we hope to submit it as well uh, during next month. So, now I, I want to change gears and move on to this different model of auditory cortex. So thanks to the success we're having with M1, uh, we got into this project, which is building a model of auditory cortex of macaques, macaque monkeys. And uh, this is a project in collaboration with another institution who is looking at the role of brain oscillations in speech processing. So, it has become apparent that um, um, oscillations have a major role in understanding speech. So for example, the oscillations in the brain, they seem to align with the frequency of the speech and that makes it easier to understand speech. And when this gets uh, disaligned, it seems that we have some uh, issues and problems that result potentially in disorders such as schizophrenia, autism, dyslexia, and other language disorders. So the idea was to investigate these oscillations in auditory cortex and potential mechanisms to neuromodulate. So for example, modify these oscillations in the brain through electric stimulation or pharmacology uh, effects. So the approach we're gonna follow is use the experimental data to build this very detailed model and then predict what kind of neuromodulation is required to improve the symptoms of some of these disorders. So in this case, we decided to build a model that also included all of sort of these input pathways to the auditory cortex. So sound comes through the uh, cochlea, it's processing the cochlea, which generates electrical signals from the sound that goes into another region called the inferior colliculus, and then to another region called the medial geniculate body, the thalamus. And so we implemented a model for each of these steps. And so we're processing the sound and converting the sound to the signals 
on each of these steps and then providing that as input to our cortical model. So this allows us to play any arbitrary sound. So the same sounds we're using in the experiments with the monkeys, we can play to the, to the model and convert, process the sound in the same way that the brain would do. For the auditory cortex model itself, we were gathering data again for like six months, just figuring out all the different cell types, the different layer boundaries. Of course, in this macaque monkey, things are slightly different. So we had to gather all this information and then again build uh, this very detailed model with now we have 41 different cell types, including this area called the thalamus. Uh, with all the properties of, this, of each of the cell types based on biology, the connectivity based on biology as well. Here we see some of the experimental data that we use to construct this massive connectivity matrix between all the different populations in the auditory cortex and the thalamus. Of course, this also required some tuning, as uh, we mentioned before. Uh, even though we have experimental data, we have to make these minor adjustments within the bio biological valid ranges to make the model actually do uh, respond in a realistic biological way. So for this, we have started doing these massive parameter sweep, sweeps where we explore different values of different, uh, between four and six different connectivity parameters. And we try to find combinations that actually result in all of the populations in the network producing the appropriate firing rate. So this again required thousands of simulations on Google Cloud. Here you can see some of the results showing for each of the populations. So now we have to analyze all this data and try to figure out which of these combinations of parameters are the right ones. We did get some preliminary results, uh, which are quite promising. So we see these oscillations that we were looking for um, in different parts of the circuit. And of course, this allows us to generate signals similar to the ones that are recorded from the monkey's brain and compared to actual experimental data. So we see these spectrograms of the activity in different layers in the model, and it's already quite similar to what you can see in uh, experimental data. And uh, we are beginning to prepare a paper, but we all, I also wanted to mention that we, uh, we got a, a talk at this conference that was organized last week called Neuromatch, which is the first uh, massive online conference which was organized due to uh, the inability to do conferences in person. And so it got like a really big response, almost over 2000 attendees. And so we got, we were able to get a, a talk in this conference and present the results of our model. So one of the other students, Erica, uh, presented this work uh, actually two days ago. So finally, I want to talk about the tool that we've been using to build all these models and how we converted this tool to an open source uh, web-based tool that other researchers can use. So the tool is called NetPine. It stands for networks using Python and Neuron. Neuron is the backend simulator that we use. And so this is a tool that you can use to build, to simulate, and to analyze these large scale brain circuit models. We have made now this GUI graphical interface, which is web-based and is available online. It's very focused on facilitating cloud computing, and I will talk more about that in a minute. And it's of course open source and free for anyone to use. So uh, many students, uh, researchers, even clinicians have started using the tool. We published a paper uh, last year in eLife describing um, this new tool. And we've, uh, because the tool also includes some um, machine learning analysis. Uh, so as Bill was saying at the beginning, we use machine learning to analyze the output of our simulations. And so we recently published also a paper describing the interaction between machine learning and the kind of multi-scale modeling that we do. So how has Google Cloud contributed to this uh, tool? Um, so one of the things we wanted to do recently uh, was to improve 
uh, use an improved backend simulator. So we're using currently Neuron, but there's a new version called Core Neuron, which has been shown to have speed ups of uh, up to seven times and seven times memory saving as well. So we wanted to incorporate this new optimized backend simulator to our tool. And so we had to run many simulations to actually test and debug how to integrate both of them. So in collaboration with the Bluebrain project, which are the guys developing this improved uh, tool, we were able to work out how to integrate both of them. And now NetPine is able to run these simulations on this new uh, backend uh, simulator. Uh, which will hopefully also facilitate and enable running these very large skill simulations uh, by saving a lot of the credits that are required. The other big thing um, that we use Google Cloud and the ACAS project for is um, something that we're working on with the Google guys. So we want to be able to uh, submit simulations from the GUI, from the web-based GUI, directly to Google Cloud. So users should be able to log in, build their models, and then submit these large simulations directly. And this wasn't an easy job because uh, we wanted to provide also the option of being able to build their own simulations to their own account. And so we are working with Google Cloud uh, to find a solution to that. And we're testing that using the, the ECAS and Google Cloud credits. So just to mention that NetPine, this tool is also available now in another major neuroscience portal called the Open Source Brain Portal, which is developed in Europe. And so you can build these models and run the simulations through that portal as well using our tool. Uh, we also published a paper uh, last year on this tool, the Open Source Brain, uh, in the Neuron Journal. And we have recently received a sort of award grant from the Human Brain Project to integrate our tool, NetPine, on their new uh, neuroscience portal, which is called eBrains, which includes several simulation tools. And so we will be working with them this year to integrate our tool as well there, so people, users can connect there and run our simulations on our tool. So just to mention that the tool is already pretty widely used by the community. There are at least 77 models that we know of that have been developed. Uh, over 40 different labs have used the tool. And there's a full list of all the models here. And these are just some, some examples of different models being developed, different parts of the brain, different phenomena from universities all around the world. So just to mention two quick examples, uh, we are working with Brown University. Uh, one, of, one tool that they were developing is called the Human Neocortical Neurosolver. And the idea is to use this kind of very detailed models to interpret EEG signals, electroencephalography, and so interpret what uh, circuits or changes in the biophysical circuit are causing different disorders. And so we worked together with them to uh, start using our tool. So they converted their model to our NetPine tool to make it easier to uh, scale the network and customize the parameters, and also run on the simulations. And so we're also working together with them on building this GUI to run their model together with our, with our tool. And another final example is this idea of as this model, uh, which was implemented in a different simulator. The interesting thing is that it has 80,000 neurons, which is a pretty large number, although there are much simpler models than the one we were describing before. The model also has 300 million synapses. So we were able to convert this model to NetPine and run it on our tool on Google Cloud, also using the, the ECAS credits. It took approximately two days to run the simulations. And we were able to compare to the previous implementation, the original implementation, and show that the results are uh, statistically identical. And we're also writing a paper describing this new implementation and how we run the simulations on Google Cloud, together with a collaboration with the University of Sao Paulo. So finally, uh, just to summarize, uh, how, how has cloud computing advanced science on our side? So first, the technology that has been enabled by ECAS and has served our science is 
first of all, this ability to run on many simultaneous cores. In our case, we run up to 100K, but we could go higher. Uh, enabling these long simulation times over a week, uh, we run for this avalanche simulation. This we hope very fast and low latency simulations on Google Cloud placement groups. We're also able to develop this uh, optimization method, evolutionary optimization for large scale networks, uh, thanks to the setup that we did on Google Cloud. And of course, the very useful setup uh, using GCP's LARM, where you can have many different users in the lab submit jobs and uh, do their own science independently using a single cluster. So this has enabled us to first develop, as far as we know, the most biologically detailed model of mouse motor cortex circuits, as well as the most biologically detailed model of macaque auditory cortex circuits. And using these two models, we have been able to find some insights into these very important neural coding mechanisms at many different scales, molecular, cellular, circuit scales. So I have described some of them during the presentation. And of course, we have also uh, been able to develop further this brain modeling tool, which is cloud-based and provides access to this kind of modeling to the wider scientific community with over 70 brain models developed by over 40 labs. Um, the applications uh, of this science, as Bill was talking about at the beginning, is a major one is understanding and developing treatments for different brain disorders. Advancing these brain machine interfaces in, in such a way that they're not only controlling some outside um, robot or arm, but that they can also provide inputs back into the brain. So having a full closed loop system where the patient can feel, for example, what they're touching. And this has many, many applications. And finally, developing novel, novel artificial intelligence algorithms. So we know that the brain can still do many things that we cannot do with AI. And in fact, many of the major algorithms in AI were inspired by the brain, for example, deep learning. So we think that there are still many hidden gems that we can find and make use of from understanding the brain. A quick summary of some of the publications generated and enabled thanks to ICA. So four journal papers that were published, four others are submitted or in preparation, two conference papers, uh, 16 abstract, conference abstracts. Uh, we were awarded one grant, uh, this HBP eBrains, and we have submitted three of them which have benefited from our use of ICAS. Finally, very briefly, we have many ideas of what to do in phase two. Uh, so one clear uh, thing would to do would be to scale up these models from the small size, well, relatively small size we have now to having multiple columns and in particular connecting different parts of the cortex, so sensory and motor cortices together. And this would allow us to explore many different phenomena and connect and simulate this full sensory motor loop. So I want to thank all the collaborators, uh, all the people from SUNY Downset who work on this project, as well as all our collaborators from different institutions. And thank Jamie, which who I think has done a fantastic job. And thanks, of course, Internet2 and NSF for this opportunity. And uh, thank you for uh, another great presentation. Um, uh, I think there's... Um, going to be a, a number of questions, hopefully, but um, one of the things uh, I noticed you talked about is a potential uh, new uh, um, AI algorithms, uh, etc. cetera. Um, uh, one of the questions, one of the things that you mentioned back early on um, was uh, also uh, asked by uh, Daniel. Curious, you mentioned one neuron and its connections can process about the same as seven layer neuron uh, a seven layer neural network. Can you give more details? Um, is that a convolutional, convolutional neural network, image size connected? You know, um, can yes. you expand on that a little bit? Um, I'll, I'm sorry, I'll take Daniel off mute too so he can actually ask the question properly. Uh, yeah, so, right, yeah, some details yeah. into that equivalence. I'm just curious. Yeah, so. I mean, I, I don't know all the details of that particular paper, but um, the, it was a convolutional network, so it had these different stages for 
uh, selectivity and invariance. And I think the idea was they were trying to have this classification task where you provide different inputs that the neuron can learn and, uh, and then sort of complete patterns. And so they tested this in both a single neuron, providing inputs to different parts of the different synapses of the dendrite. And then the neuron either had to fire or fire in a particular pattern to identify the different groups of inputs, different categories. And so I think that's how they made the comparison with the, the neural network. I can send the references for the papers. That's a bioarchive paper by Segev, S-E-G-E-V. Is that right, Sonor? Yes. And, uh, yes no. Yeah, I mean, one of the other points that we like to make is that the realistic networks, the realistic individual neurons as well, are probably using different coding strategies that we haven't thought about yet in terms of artificial neural networks. So when we say we can contribute to changing our thinking about artificial neural networks, we're partly saying that you know it's not just mapping what we currently know about encodings and the best way to do encodings back onto the neurons, but rather to really understand better what the neurons can do that the uh, artificial neural networks can't yet do. Uh, a question on a slightly different track from uh, me. The, uh, You've obviously uh, modeled a range of different neurons uh, for, for humans and also for mice and macaque monkeys. Uh, do you have to do a lot, uh, are they significantly different models and you, do you have to do a lot of retraining or is there a bit of a potential reuse in there? Uh, there's some reuse, definitely. And some one of the things that may change, for example, is the the size of the neurons. For example, if you compare mice to macaque, the dendrites of the macaque are larger to reach the upper layers of the circuit. And of course, the response can be quite similar. And uh, the particular areas of the brain that differ greatly between different species, and you note it mostly when you go from, uh, for example, a predator prey predator species, such as ourselves actually, and, and most other primates. Uh, to a prey species. Uh, and then you see, for example, the visual system may be quite differently organized in order to handle very different problems. So we do get a lot of reuse, uh, for example, going across motor cortex of several different species, but there are also these, these remarkable differences that uh, are, are very interesting. Uh, the, th the thing that makes I think brain special and different brains areas special is that unlike a von Neumann serial computer, these are not general purpose machines. They're very highly evolved to do very specific, well, not specific things. They have their generality too, but they're very good at some things. And so what a, a prey has to be good at is different than what a predator has to be good at. So there's both reuse and there are lots of interesting different problems as we go across species and certainly across brain areas. Okay, very good. Uh, I'll ask if there's any other questions, otherwise uh, I might start to wrap up. I've usually said that, and then there's one more question. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, I'll do one more. Um, just just uh, sort of my, I guess it's been my standard question so far, but just for the kind of simulations that you're doing on, on GCP, uh, it takes a long time. Do, you ha do they have big data sets that you need to work on, or the data that you have is relatively small or can all be contained within uh, Google while you're doing the process or the simulation? Yeah, actually the data hasn't been a big issue uh, in terms of the cost. It's very minimal compared to the computation time. So we might be uh, 50 gigabytes maximum per simulation, uh, which is very manageable. But as we get to having more data about specific connectivity, we're going to be ramping that up. And again, this is very much a collaboration, not just with our own personal collaborators, but with the neuroscience research community, where because of the new tools that are being developed, partly through the auspices of the Obama Brain Project and others with great interest in this, there's now going to be tens of thousands, and actually the hope is uh, in 10 years, a million cells being recorded from, details of wiring, and so that the data that both we compare to and the data that comes into creating the models is going ramp up substantially. Great, thanks. All right, well, uh, again, we're a few minutes over time, so uh, I'll wrap this all up and uh, say thank you very much to, uh, to Selva and to Bill and
to all the rest of the team who we didn't actually see, but no contributed to it. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you.